Good. Hello, everybody. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Wolf Ties, the Future of Series. My name is Andrea Gritsch, and I have the pleasure of moderating this event. Throughout the Future of Series, we are looking at a wide variety of disruptive technologies and innovation in different industry sectors. Together with leading experts in the areas of business, law, and technology, we explore current developments and future trends shaping the markets of tomorrow and influencing modern society. The future of healthcare is on today's agenda, hosted by my partner Florian Kuznir, a firm believer in the need to modernize, and counsel Kamila Severova, a pharma law enthusiast. Good morning. Healthcare has a direct impact on all of us personally, undoubtedly. Healthcare brings us together in front of a computer today, rather than physically in a room. Led by our distinguished speakers, let's now venture into the future of healthcare. We will be touching on a wide range of topics, trying to look beyond the current pandemic when it comes to travel, medtech, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, care for the elderly, food and sustainability, hospitals of the future, and bioterrorism. Andrea, over to you again to lead us through today's exciting discussions. Thanks. Before we jump right into today's session, um, there are three housekeeping rules I would like to, to remember. Each speaker is asked to limit his or her speech to five minutes. We will display a virtual timeline counting backwards and indicating when time is up. Second, I would kindly ask all participants to hold their questions until our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You are, of course, invited to submit your questions via our chat function at any time. And third, everybody please mute. Without further ado, I will now turn to our first speaker, Günther Weiss, on the topic of life after the pandemic and will we ever be able to travel again as freely as before COVID-19. Dr. Weiss is Professor of Medicine at the Medical University of Innsbruck in Austria and Director of the Department of Internal Medicine. He has authored more than 340 peer-reviewed scientific papers with more than 25,000 citations throughout his career. Dr. Weiss, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, greetings from Innsbruck. So the question is, is life after the pandemic, will we ever be able to travel again as freely as before COVID-19? So as you know, the COVID pandemic has changed the face of the world and impacted significantly on every aspect of daily life. As one measure to reduce the spread of infection, closing of borders and travel restrictions, restrictions were implemented on the original, national and international level. Countries have set up different strategies to combat the challenges of COVID-19 pandemics which significantly differ in between member states of the United uh, of the European Union. It is quite obvious that COVID-19 and other transmissible infectious diseases, specifically respiratory infections, will persistently remain on our planet and, among other effects, significantly impact on our travel. Numerous precautions have been introduced to prevent transmissions of infectious diseases or its introduction to countries which will remain in order for months and years or possibly also forever. With the implementation of vaccination programs and these health precautions, it may become evident that certain states will request vaccination certificates documenting effective protection from several infections, including COVID-19, as it is already mandatory when you are entering or leaving a country where, for example, yellow fever is prevalent. In addition, negative testing certificates of uh, antigenic tests or PCR or uh, antibody uh, certificates may be requested before entering a vehicle, for example, in the airplane or train, or when you're crossing borders, uh, independently of the vaccination strategy. Hygiene prevention strategies such as wearing masks in planes or trains or buses or repeated hand disinfections will remain mandatory for a certain period of time. What is currently missing is a coordinated strategy among different countries or even counties uh, in certain states uh, which uh, really coordinate the different efforts on a, a predictable level. 
there are a number of open questions, not only on the duration of the pandemics, but also, for example, on the role of emerging mutations, specifically such uh, immune escape uh, variants, which can target convalescent or vaccinated people, and uh, which will probably lead to very uh, uh, fast uh, implementation of restriction or limitation of, of traveling. Once the pandemic has ended and epidemics with microbes can be partly better controlled by vaccination programs and uh, after daily hygiene precautions have taken place uh, in our daily life, restrictions may be stepwise lifted and partial normalization of travel will re-emerge. However, some restrictions may remain as, for example, uh, hy hygiene precautions as hand hygiene or probably wearing masks specifically in the cold season to prevent uh, transmission of respiratory infections such as COVID-19 or influenza. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. I would now move to our second speaker, which is Susanna Hodanova on the topic of telemedicine and will doctors always have to see patients in person? Susanna is counsel at Wolf Thais Bratislava with extensive experience in healthcare, pharmaceuticals and life science law. Prior to joining Wolf Thais, she formerly worked in an international pharmaceutical firm in Slovakia. Susanna, the stage is yours. Good morning, all of you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you and greetings from Bratislava. So, will doctors always have to see patients in person? In order to answer this question, we first need to understand what telemedicine is. Although the practice of medicine is regulated across the globe, it does not always fit within the traditional areas of law. In many countries, there is no definition of telemedicine under applicable law. Essentially, the purpose of telemedicine is to provide clinical support with the use of various types of communication technology. Nowadays, telemedicine is used in many countries in the form of mHealth applications for mobile phones and other devices designed to diagnose or treat a particular illness or disability. In Slovakia, telemedicine has been addressed by the law only in relation to the current COVID-19 situation although electronic prescriptions has been regulated by a law as of 2018. The legislative change adopted in May 2020 created an opportunity to provide outpatient health care in the form of consultations via electronic devices without the need to see a doctor in person. Real life experience has shown that it has become common practice to hold consultations over the phone or by email, and such remote provision of healthcare is conditional upon verification of the identity and relationship of patient with her health insurer. According to statistical data collected by one of the private health insurer, number of medical acts recorded by the health insurer during the last year increased by almost 20% as compared with the year preceding the last year when the percentage of such acts represented only approximately 2%. This form of provision of healthcare has historically been addressed also in the Code of Ethics of the Slovak Medical Chamber, according to which doctors may use electronic communication means such as internet, email or Skype in emergencies, especially in the light uh, of threatening situations. As the world corresponds to COVID-19, physicians and patients increasingly turn to telemedicine solutions. A good example of the use of such telemedicine solution during the pandemic in Slovakia is the e-quarantine application. As the name suggests, the application was particularly designed to monitor those in quarantine by collecting all relevant data from persons mobile, such as location, face recognition, health condition, days remaining until the end of quarantine, 
and this was followed by testing for COVID-19. I would like to stress that under normal circumstances in Slovakia, the lab test would have to be ordered by physician. Currently, patients in many countries can apply for COVID-19 tests online and receive results directly through a text message or email. This in turn opens opportunity for cross-border healthcare when, for example, a laboratory abroad analyzes test samples collected in the home country. Nevertheless, there still seems to be multiple barriers to cross-border activities, such as regulatory aspects surrounding licensing, data protection aspects, reimbursement, uh, and uh, this all legal framework for e-quarantine application in Slovakia has so far not been regulated. As I already mentioned, the implementation of telemedicine requires addressing a broad area of a complex legal issues, such as mandatory rules in covering telemedicine, including professional codes, restriction of advertising, prescriptions, e-prescriptions, reimbursement, personal data protection in healthcare sector, and as well, cross-border offerings. Also, I would like to note that telemedicine requires a functional and safe digital environment, which most hospitals, especially government-operated hospitals in Slovakia, do not necessarily have. I believe that any standardization of international telemedicine law is still a long way off because of these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Our third uh, speaker of today is Josef Holly, raising an interesting question, which is, can AI, ethics and privacy actually work together? Josef is head of product development at Semantic Visions, fighting online fake news, disinformation and manipulation. He has a wide range of experience from corporate and startup environments, building social, social knowledge networks and founding e-commerce ventures. Josef, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, my task will be to today to basically talk about AI and ethics in five minutes. So let's let's give it a try. First thing which I would like to start with is that AI as artificial intelligence is sort of this, this mythical term, right? We are putting a lot of uh, expectations into the technology. We are going through AI revolution these days and we are putting a lot as, as mankind, as people into it. We expect it to move us you know, higher in the terms of quality of life and healthcare for that matter. We are putting a lot of fears into it also that, you know, it will steal our jobs, automate uh, away the need for human labor, etc. Um, first thing which is important to realize is that AI as a technology is a tool and there is a whole philosophy, a philosophical field behind, uh, you know, if tools are opinionated, uh, do guns kill people or do people kill people with guns? That's, that's the fundamental question. And one could argue that AI as a technology is sort of neutral and it depends what we use it for. So that's where the ethics come into play. Uh, another thing which is important to realize is that AI with this mythical beast, beast is currently built around data. So it's algorithm, it's a piece of computer software, However sophisticated, doesn't matter. Uh, these days, these pieces of software are very sophisticated. They are running uh, in large server farms online in the cloud and uh, require quite huge amounts of data to do what we want them to do. So if you want AI to be able to recognize objects on a picture, on an image, you need to train it first. So there is this moment of training of AI, which is somehow similar to how we raise our kids or how we train for a job. So first you need to be exposed to the experience. The experience for the AI are the data to learn what how the world works. So image recognizer needs to see millions of images first before such AI can recognize stuff or images. And this need for data is a driving paradigm behind current AI revolution, and it's also a driving force behind 
the biggest companies which are on the forefront of the AI revolution, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and others. Uh, and by the way, both all of these techn technology companies are looking into healthcare as an interesting field to be disrupted with their technologies. Uh, Shoshana Zubov, three years ago, Harvard professor Shoshana Zubov wrote a, a fundamental book, uh, which is called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, where she dissects uh, how the current hunger for data, and as she is calling it, how extraction imperative, which is the main driving business imperative behind current technology companies works. Uh, and it's all centered around a simple imperative that they need to get at as much data as possible. It's not that they would be evil, it's the nature of their business. Because the more data they get, the better machine learning, artificial intelligence models they will get. And this applies, and this, proper, sorry, this represents a natural risk for our privacy, which is often being discussed in connection to AI. So in the grand vision of application of AI in healthcare, we are not looking on only into electronic medical records or your you know, health cards, which are stored somewhere at the doctor's office in case of less developed countries. We are looking into a complete picture, data profile, uh, data fingerprint of each individual, but also of the whole population. And that's what Amazon, Google, Facebook, and others are very well positioned for because they have mechanisms to harvest those data. So there is certainly a risk in privacy, and the question is how the privacy should be taken care of. Because right now, it's those companies who are extracting patterns from those data, who are accumulating the data, and who are giving us back their service. One could argue that in 21st century, uh, it should be an extension of current constitution, constitutional rights, and that our data in their whole sheer you know, breadth and depth should be taken care of and protected by government, by the constitution. Because if we, if we lose privacy on a large scale, we are talking about environmental data, the environment we are living in, our genetic data, our habits, what we eat, how we behave, uh, our psychological profiles, behavioral profiles, all that stuff assembled together can provide something what is called personalized medicine, which is like the grand data-driven vision or AI-driven vision. But there is this huge privacy risk in there. So one could argue that uh, governments instead of uh, private corporations should be taking care of our data. Um, another thing is that uh, those uh, algorithms are being developed, AI is being developed in a black box manner. So it's often being supplied. So if you get a, an AI which can analyze uh, uh, an images from, uh, from X-ray, X-ray images for you, which by the way, AI can do very well these days, uh, it should be required uh, that the code, the, the, the algorithm and how it was built and what data it was trained on uh, should be auditable. It should be made transparent and it should be made regulated, which is often not the case. So what I'm, just to close up here, my five minute speech, what I'm calling about, uh, what, what we should call for in order to deploy AI in a meaningful way into healthcare is a focus on privacy, regulation and transparency, both in terms of the data as for privacy in terms of protection, as well as in terms of, you know, how the algorithms and systems are built so they do the right thing and don't do and cause unintended consequences. Thank you, and I guess I'm done. Thank you very much, Josef. And uh, straight running to our fourth speaker, Ilse Sima Boyd, on the topic of society getting older and older and the question who will take care of the elderly and whether we can afford to actually get older. Yeah. For the last eight years, Ilse has worked upper level management in the social service sector. Within the elderly care department of Caritas in Vienna, she manages 12 assisted living facilities and a number of home care units, which together are staffed with approximately 2,300 employees. Ilse, very interested to hear your topic. Thank you very much. Thank you for the inter uh, invitation and the kind introduction. Um, the future of healthcare and who takes care of the elderly should be my goal with all the solutions, I guess, 
um, tackling this issue. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of data and background, even though it is difficult um, over the screen and with uh, without charts, but um, to fill you in, by 2060, about 155 million Europeans, that is 30% of the total European populations, will be aged 65 and older. And the share of people that are over 80 by 2050 is expected to double across the USCD countries. We also estimate that we will need um, at least uh, double, but maybe triple our expenditures, our, our GDP product across the OECD countries by that time to afford the elderly care and to take care of the elderly people. Um, all this also comes with uh, us getting older. Um, this is a good, good thing, but it also comes with a few um, issues that we have to tackle. We have falling birth rates in Europe um, and across the world, but also in Europe. So we are the oldest population across the continent and becoming older also comes with a few health challenges. Um, the biggest ones are chronic diseases such as Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Um, we expect that um, about 18 million to 19 million people will um, have dementia it's, or, or some other sort um, by the time of 2050. Um, other other uh, issues such as cancer and heart care uh, heart diseases will also we're all in need of some sort of um, necessity for long term um, care. This is us, by the way. We're talking about um, um, it is it is our generation we're, um, um, that will be in need of care. We'll also have to live longer. And the European system so far all throughout Europe um, puts. Uh, taking care of elderly people on the shoulders, mainly of family members. Um, there's hardly any institutional or professional home care. It's mainly family members. We're talking about 70 to 80 percent um, of elderly people are taking care by their family members. Now, since we have a reducing workforce and thus um, we need more people in work to actually keep up our social systems, we also um, have to figure out how we how we deal with this issue um, so that we don't have a slow economic growth. We have people in the workforce and also we need models that uh, don't put so much um, uh, stress on one caregiver or two family caregiving members because it decreases usually the, the, the uh, earning possibility of a household. It also is a disruptive system for the family that takes care of it. Most of the time, people are juggling um, with care and other responsibilities, have a time management issue. Um, and most of the time, caregivers are a lot also affected by isolation. And that has a strain and a significant strain also of, in the relationship of the caregiver and the person in need of care. But it also has, an, uh, of course, an effect on the quality that an individual can provide or an individual can receive. Well, furthermore, uh, of course, women are the ones who um, provide most of the, the caregiving, uh, but are also receiving less of the uh, informal caregiving, um, therefore. So what are the needs? The needs um, in Europe, as I said, uh, well, we need to manage a financial sustainability for our health care systems and our, our elderly care systems. We will have to figure out a way how to create jobs um, uh, in this sector, significant jobs. The, the number here would be that um, we expect by 2060 that we have one caregiver um, for 51 people um, over the age of 80 if we grow at the growth rate we are growing right now. So I can from experience tell you that that is by far not enough to take care of people over the uh, older than 80. And um, we also need to prepare us, our generation, to realize um, for a healthier and more active aging system. Yeah. Um, I would like to share with you some approaches to tackle this, uh, tackle these issues. I have one minute left to do so. Um, we, I would like to 
professional care at home. Um, we have a lot of put into institution. We have not supported throughout Europe the system of professional care at home. So people coming home, supporting the family system with um, with care. That is uh, one of the biggest, biggest um, 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 moments we have to actually give uh, create efficiencies in our healthcare system. The other is um, flexible work arrangements and leave regulations for people who are giving informal care. That is what we have learned in the pandemic. Home, home office and other things are easier these days, and that would also support people giving care at home. Diversity in care. We need a diversity in care so people can choose what kind of care they would like to have and would like to um, um, regarding their own care decisions. Um, just one or two more sentences. Uh, technological innovations in care are helping us a lot, and that's a huge field but knowing that most of the care is done by organizations such as Caritas, we're not funded to um, invest in such technology, technological in, in innovations. And we probably might need an adaption of our taxation systems and mechanisms. That's not my field of expertise, but having a lot of burden on the workforce might not pay for our future speed in the healthcare sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ilse, for this insight into a very relevant topic of our near term future. Now turning to the quick speaker, Matei Daniel, on the topic of 3D printing and whether it is a real game changer in the implementable medical devices industry. Professor Dr. Matei Daniel is specialized in clinical biomechanics of the hip joint and its replacements and cell mechanics. Since 2006, he has been working at the Department of Mechanics, Biomechanics and Mechatronics, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering in the Czech Technical University in Prague. Matej, this is your floor. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, as you told, my background is originally in biomedical physics. Now I'm working at the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and I'm leading a group of engineers who are actually trying to design new generations of uh, medical devices using so-called additive manufacturing. So first to explain what is the additive manufacturing may be better now for you under the name of 3D printing. We can consider comparison with the traditional way of the manufacturing using subtractive method, which is milling, CNC turning, laser cutting, or carving, like uh, Michelangelo who built the David statue out of the marble block. Then the traditional way how we will reproduce the medical implants. However, with uh, the additive manufacturing, uh, you are putting layer of uh, material after layer, and you are actually building your uh, uh, product out of uh, the computer model. Originally, 3D printing was designed only for prototyping. Therefore, also our laboratory is originally named as a laboratory of rapid prototyping, not uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Originally, this was uh, used only for plastic and just to make an appropriate shape. So you probably, some of you have uh, your own 3D printer, relatively cheap 3D printer, so you can print a keychain or uh, uh, something uh, very simple. However, the commercial 3D printers are far beyond that. In uh, commercial 3D printers, we are able to print out of metal materials like steel or titanium alloy by fusing a layer after layer of metal powder. And actually the product you are creating out of this have the strength as original uh, titanium. So uh, in my laboratory, we are were able to show that using uh, 3D printing from uh, titanium powder, we can achieve 90% of the strength of solid titanium. So that's more than enough for most of the applications. So uh, as a result, you can design your uh, implant in the computer based on the CT scans of the patient, uh, make it specifically for given patients, and you can build a complex structure. So in shape to match the shape of the bone, not only that, you can also change the mechanical properties. So you can uh, make uh, it softer at one part and harder and other part. You can make a gradient layer, you can make a porous surface, outer, inner, 
whatever, you should really stretch your engineering imaginations because that technology can help us in creating something that we are not able to do in the last 100 years of uh, the engineering. For example, uh, we make a project in uh, which we create a hollow joint, hip joint replacement and put an electronics inside, which actually monitor the lifetime of the joint implants, and therefore we make so-called smart implant. So the implant that can help the uh, medical professionals to assess its uh, performance during the lifetime and warn about the failure of that. So this means the change in the paradigm that uh, we have for creating the artificial joints, where now we have, uh, let's say, the approach one size fits all. So you have just a series of uh, sizes, uh, for example, of the knee implants, and then based on size of your bone, you will get the size two or size four. The same as you are choosing the size of your shoes. However, we have uh, many sizes of the shoes, but, and for the implants, usually four sizes are enough. So with that, you can make approach where you will print individual joint replacements for individual patients. Such uh, joint replacements will assimilate with the patient's body, reduce the rejection space, and shorten the healing time. Also, it will allow so-called on-demand productions. Now, the hospitals actually need to buy the joint implants in advance, and they are usually buying that in a bench. So you, so you say, oh, we probably do uh, 1,000 of the surgeries of the knee, so let's buy 100, uh, 1,000 knee implants. And okay, we were not good for everyone, but we will use the cheapest one or the best one. How, how we can define which one is the best for a given patient if we don't know who will be the patient. So in that, you can treat that for a given patient directly in the hospital which will change the way the medical device producer works. So they will be no longer producing the implants, but they will be providing the service. They will create the implant for given patient. The implant actually will be printed somewhere else. It seems uh, very nice. However, that's not really realistic in that. For me. Why I say this is not uh, realistic? is that uh, unfortunately we don't have problems from the perspective of the technology or on engineering. We can create the implant. If we get the CT scans, we can print anything, almost anything to fit. We, we are sure that it's better than a general implant. However, there is one part which is related to you, and that's actually the legislation. Uh, medical device regulations by European Union, the number 745 uh, uh, adopted in 2017 and which will be actually valid in uh, two years, uh, is very strict. The main aim, aim of these regulations is to protect public health and ensure safety and performance. However, all these regulations was built on the all types of the production. So you are producing thousands of implants then you will choose few of them, few of them, and you will prove that these are safe. And then you say, okay, if uh, ten of my implants are safe, then the rest is safe as well. So, calculating this uh, testing procedure, clinical trials, all of that into number of the implants you will produce, uh, it's negligible uh, price. However, according to new regulation, uh, you must do that for every implant, even if you print that. For individual patient, you must prove that it is safe, and it is safe in the same manner, almost in the same manner as if you are producing a million of, uh, of joint replacements. So the price for the individual implants currently is so high that nobody is able to afford that. Just to compare, the regular hip implant can be bought at approximately a good one, would not, not uh, you can buy a cheap one, which will be for a few hundred euros, but uh, the good one is approximately a thousand euros. If you would like to buy, uh, create a hip implant by additive manufacturing, then uh, the cost of the productions 
is approximately the same, even cheaper. But the cost of doing all the paperwork related to that is 10 times higher. So you will pay um, 10,000 euros for such implant. And the price for the implant, for, for the piece of titanium, is actually just a fraction of that. The most is uh, the paperwork. You must hire the people who will do that. You must pay for the tests. You must prove your, all your technology is certified and so on. So what I want to say here is that we actually need a legislative change in that. So give more chance for the patient. The same as patients can decide for experimental treatment. The patient can decide if he wants to have the individual implants or not. For now, someone else is deciding instead of him. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Matej, for this uh, um, very interesting topic. And also for thanks for alluding to the legal side of things, which I'm sure my colleague Camila Sebagova, our next speaker, will be happy to take up in her speech on how the US and EU will respond to AI and ML in medical devices. Camila heads the life sciences team of Wolf Times Prague. And in the course of her career, she has advised life science companies on pharmaceuticals, medical devices and food supplements, clinical trials, price regulation, marketing, advertisement, pharmaceuticals, as well as, of course, compliance with regulations and ethical codes. Camila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to say only a few words about the recent regulatory developments concerning AI-based uh, medical devices in two major jurisdictions in the US and in the EU. As already mentioned here, one of the most appealing features of AI is its ability to learn from a real world experience. And this brings an opportunity to develop uh, medical devices which can better themselves over time and, for example, improve the diagnostic accuracy based on the data. In a sense, as was already mentioned in relation to 3D printing, the current regulatory framework always does not fit. Uh, it's not designed to handle uh, the new technologies, for example, these so-called adaptive or continuous learning algorithms in medical devices. These devices represent some kind of new device, uh, something which may look very different from how it worked at the time of its initial assessment evaluation. And it's simply unrealistic to expect that the agencies will review a change as it occurs and it will be also very, very expensive. So the US drug, Food and Drug Administration, FDA, proposed in 2019 a new regulatory framework for adaptive, adaptive algorithms or adaptive uh, software. And feedback to this proposal, this proposal is summarized in recently published action plan. This plan was published in January 2021. Just at a high level, because we do not have much time, this action plan outlines a new framework that permits the adaptive algorithms to change with it barriers, barriers which were specific, pre specified, predetermined at the time of the initial review of the medical device. And this is known as the total product life science approach. Uh, as an example, as a way of testing this framework, FDI has already applied it to a pilot project. Uh, the pilot project was for a device developed by a startup called Caption Health, and this device uses AI to enable untrained nurses to perform cardiac ultrasounds at the same level as qualified trained specialists. Another example, recent example, is a clearance for a product called Cluviku. It is AI-based intensive care unit software and this software predicts instability in adult patients and enables intervention by providing no no notification about potential instability up to eight hours in advance. It also identifies low-risk patients who may not need so much care. 
And these predictions are based on the available data, broad range of data, test results, vital signs, history of medications, prior hospitalizations of the patients, and so on. So this is what is happening uh, in the US. And uh, as regards the EU, EU approach to AI medical devices, there is no specific regulatory approach, no specific route for AI-based medical devices. Obviously, these medical devices need to comply with the new medical devices regulation, MDR, which becomes effective this May, and IVDR, which will become effective in one year plus GDPR. However, there are no clear guidelines how to apply these regulations to this unique category of medical devices. Still, under these M regulations, MDR and IVDR, uh, a manufacturer can place an adaptive device on the market. However, again, it can only be done within predefined scope, within predefined barriers. Uh, so far in Europe, I am aware of only one example of AI-based software which has been already certified under the MDR, and it is a solution called BI, which automatically detects, classifies, and tracks the groan of lung nodules on CT scans. And this product was developed by IDENS. Maybe you may be aware of some other examples, and we can discuss that later. Uh, just uh, another uh, piece of regulation, new piece of regulation is a European as a, a proposal for a brand new general artificial intelligence regulation, which, which was unveiled by the European Commission this April. You may have seen the information about this regulation in the media. Uh, what is clear from this proposal is that the European Commission does not take this issue very lightly and that uh, the EU, the Commission, has the medtech sector in its side with this proposal and it is expected that the AI based medical treatments and procedures may be classified as high risk under this proposed regulation. So there is a risk or it's clear that if this regulation will be adopted, uh, the manufacturers will have to comply with both with medical devices regulations and also with this new artificial intelligence regulation, which may, may bring more duties and more uh, administration difficulties on on them. However, hopefully, uh, potential duplicities will be somehow streamlined so that uh, they are not doubled for these manufacturers. Just the last sentence, I can see that I run out of time. Uh, unfortunately, the experts believe that this newly proposed air regulation could have a number of negative effects that will freeze Europe in time and the US and Asia may move forward. So let's see which continent, what continent will finally be leading in an AI medical industry, but it seems that the uh, proposed AI regulation is rather robust and strict and it may just hinder some development for the time being. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Camila. Gunnar, you were talking um, about the topic of how we can prevent bioterrorism from hijacking innovations. Um, Gunnar is university professor and senior research fellow at the Carl Friedrich von Weizsäcker Center for Science and Peace Research at Hamburg University and head of the interdisciplinary research group for the analysis of biological risks. As, as a political scientist, he studies and teaches the issue of arms control, governance of risk related to biotech, as well as ethics in science. Gunnar, happy to have your speech now. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not a professor, however, but um, um, yeah, thanks uh, for the nice introduction um, anyway. So I would like to start maybe uh, with a very brief introduction on what bioweapons are. It's, uh, there's not a positive list of agents or so, but it's the hostile use of any biological agent, so including bacteria, viruses, toxins from biological origin, um, and some more, 
Um, so with the toxins, there is a certain overlap to chemical um, weapons, but stuff like sarin or so, which is basically synthesized only chemically, is not bioweapons, but all the others, uh, bacteria and so on. Um, so bioweapons can be directed against humans, of course, but uh, we shall not forget that they can also uh, be directed against animal, so livestock um, in, in agriculture or uh, against plant, and that these might also be possible targets for bioterrorism. Um, however, bioweapons do not necessarily have to be weapons of mass destruction. They can be, of course. Uh, but also, with the definition that I just um, uh, introduced, uh, also harm, doing harm to one individual would already, when it's intentional, uh, make uh, a bioweapons use. So, have, have bioweapons attracted terrorists in the past? Not so much. Uh, if, if we look into history, we can see only uh, six events since 1972, and um, uh, two of them used uh, toxins, and they were not, su not successful. One uh, used salmonella bacteria uh, with the aim to make people sick, but not to kill them. One, uh, in fact, tried to use Ebola, but failed uh, with the procurement already. Um, then processing and spreading uh, an Ebola solution would have been much more complicated. Uh, Two used anthrax, one failed, and one um, basically was not bioterrorism um, in, in the narrow sense, which are the anthrax letters in 2001 in the United States, uh, since the motive was not really uh, religious or, or political, but private. And um, he also uh, took the uh, anthrax powder from his workplace, the United States Bioweapons Defense Lab. So oh, one has to see that uh, almost all of these uh, attempts were based on easy-to-handle agents. Um, so Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and others are not known for having interests in bioweapon, despite uh, reports of uh, a dubious cabin with very, very, very basic um, uh, equipment in Afghanistan and a, a so-called laptop of doom, which, with a closer look, might only be a laptop of mild concern. But now to the new technologies. Um, emerging technologies... Um, allow um, or make uh, genome editing cheaper, make it easier accessible, uh, make it um, uh, yeah, more democratic in a way, but that might also make it more, more dangerous. And uh, also um, the uh, DNA and RNA synthesis uh, might be captured by, by terrorists since you can then go and do mail order of sequences um, of viruses. Or bacteria. However, you have still have to stitch them together in your lab. It's not that easy. Still, not everyone can do everything, and that's the good news about it. Um, and also, when it comes to gene editing, um, uh, we see it with the pandemic out there, um, uh, takes us still months to know uh, what genetic change in the um, SARS-CoV virus uh, would make it more dangerous, uh, what in the Brazilian, the Indian, and uh, so on variant uh, would make it, um, yeah, what exactly would has what effect, and that makes also the construction of a virus uh, still a complicated thing. So can they be changes, game changers for bioterrorism? Do we have weapons from uh, of mass destruction from the garage uh, in the near future? And I would say uh, possibly not. Um, having uh, viruses um, in, a, in a little um, volume does not um, make a bioweapon already that works. Uh, still setting a disease uh, outbreak um, is not necessarily easy, might need several attempts and so on. And um, the um, bioterrorism might already be successful when um, it leads to mass disruption and not necessarily uh, mass destruction. So, um, Bioterrorists might seek for um, this disruptive um, event. And it's, of course, um, the new technologies um, might um, attract uh, terrorists. But um, uh, the good news, as I said, is 
that um, you still need expertise, you still need time, you still need um, uh, lab equipment, and most important, a safe and a stable, stable environment, and a lot of time to do such kind of research and development work, and that would it still be also uh, for terrorists. Um, that does not make the, um, uh, uh, that still does mean that we need a good control laws, and so we need a, a good control environment, um, but um, I think it will also in the future be more likely that bioterrorists uh, would do the simple approach and uh, use easy to handle agents like anthrax um, or biotoxins so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Let us uh, continue with um, Jakub Kotowski on the question of whether AI and digital technology will lead to homo deus. Jakob is stationed in Prague and leads an AI group focused on solving problems across the drug discovery and pharma value chain. In the past, he was a senior researcher and engineer at the National University of Ireland, where he helped to spin off a startup uh, company focused on big data, information retrieval, and business intelligence. Jakob, happy to hear you out. So, hi everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, my topic is a little bit provocative, uh, but, but I think uh, pretty interesting, so, so, so please uh, bear with me. So Homo Deus uh, is a book written by Yuval Noah Harari, uh, a well-known Israeli um, historian and, and intellectual. Uh, the book uh, explores the future of humanity based on the premise that we will pursue three goals, uh, and that is uh, happiness, immortality, uh, and good-like powers. Oh, that, that, those are very lofty and ambitious goals. So happiness, immortality, and good-like powers. But I claim that we are closer uh, to them uh, than you might think, and that AI and digital technologies will help us reach them eventually, even if possibly in some unintuitive ways. So let's explore this in, in the next couple of minutes. So first, let's begin uh, with happiness and immortality, or in other words, mental and physical health and, and fitness. So that's related to healthcare and life sciences, and AI has had a long history in, in life sciences. I'll give you just uh, two old examples and, and a recent one. So in the 1960s, scientists already started modeling uh, the relationship between the structure of molecules and their activity, their influence on, on living cells. This is at the core of drug discovery. It is the so-called uh, field QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship. And many AI and mathematical methods have been applied to it since the 1960s until now. In the 1970s, people started implementing expert systems, modeling, for example, expert medical doctors. Oh, and then we will skip ahead to, to last year. Uh, when Google DeepMind announced the AlphaFold system. So a, a powerful AI system, which essentially solved the protein folding problem. So how proteins fold into what 3D shapes. This is a very important uh, problem uh, related to drug discovery, drug development, also, of, of, for example, vaccines. So AI has a long uh, history of, of a supporting role in, in healthcare, pharma and, and life sciences and definitely helps with analyzing data and, and in future it will help with personalized medicine, which is important also for aging and, and happiness. And I'll uh, speak a little bit about aging uh, now or immortality. So, so I introduced it as immortality. In other words, it means aging. And there's a fascinating new theory uh, introduced by David Sinclair, a Harvard professor. Uh, he essentially says that aging is a disease that can be in principle cured. And he has a very interesting story how, how this happens, you know, backed by scientific papers and so on. He even says that there are already clinical trials on the way that will improve the vitality of old people and maybe even extend our lives. So this is, uh, I highly recommend to you reading his book, uh, Lifespan. So immortality essentially is within the realm of the possible. At least David Sinclair will, will convince you of that, I, I, I believe. So what about happiness? 
uh, that is related to neuroscience. And in neuroscience, in neurological diseases, that, that has been a, a tough nut to, to crack. But lately, we've been making uh, quite a lot of progress there. For example, treating post-traumatic stress disorder. Just three days ago, uh, the New York Times published an article uh, about a successful phase three clinical trial uh, of MDMA-assisted uh, uh, therapy. Uh, so that's MDMA as, as the otherwise known as, as the party drug ecstasy. Uh, it cured more than 60 per, uh, 60% patients out of their uh, PTSD. At the same time, digital technologies are being implemented that help us tune our consciousness or our state of mental well-being. For example, meditation apps. But it goes even beyond that into digital psychedelics and so on. So AI and, and neuroscience mutually reinforce itself since, since the beginning, essentially. AI is inspired by the brain, but it can also help verify some of the theories put forth by, by neuroscience. So that's happiness and immortality. What about the godlike powers? I think that the interesting thing about godlike powers is that we may not actually need them. Um, the reason is uh, that there is also another uh, very interesting theory of, of consciousness. You know, for, for a long time, people said that there's that nothing of importance was said about consciousness, but it is changing in the last couple of years. And the theory of virtualism um, says that, that our brains, our minds function essentially as great virtual reality machines. And you can see how that may be possible if you think about how vivid your dreams are. And, and uh, you can think about optic uh, optic illusions as, as sort of glitches in, in, in those machines. So so instead of instead of really attaining good like powers, we can just change how we perceive, how we sense the world. And that is also within the realm of, of the possible. So to conclude, I think that if humanity survives the many existential risks, then there is a good chance uh, that it will achieve something close to Homo Deus. This may sound scary from today's perspective, but it should not be because uh, we could probably be already seen as gods, for example, to hunter gatherers, but we still have a long way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Jakob. Good. Um, moving to our next speaker, Janis Wittstum. Janis is a director for the German, Israeli, Greek, Austrian and Swiss operations of Medtronic Integrated Health Solutions offering a wide range of experience in this particular industry. Yanis, may I ask for your participation? Thank you, Andrea, and thanks for the nice words of introductions. Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me. So when I was asked to give some thoughts on the future of the hospital, I realized it's it's, it's barely impossible to be right, right? And uh, when I just heard that this session is going to be, rec it's going to be recorded today, I wonder how um, we all will look back to this in two years or in 10 years and say, wow, what we, what we thought was going to happen, it just won't be, be right, right? Was anyone making a prediction two years ago and just November 19 would have miserably failed? So the good news here is that we have some crystal ball. So we cannot see the super disruptive things, but some things are just extrapolating and that worked well, at least for my industry in the last um, three decades or so, just to give you some examples. When the automotive industry in 1987 decided that ISO uh, 9000 would be the industry standard, just some 10 years later, the first hospital got certified. And the same with, you know, when um, Six Sigma took off in an industry in 1996, some 12 years later, the first hospital got certified. So you see these trends and it's just a question of time when this hits the healthcare market. We're always a little bit um, lagging behind hospitals. Just one thing, and I pledge to not speak about digital health, everybody does it. Um, and I, I, my personal opinion is that we have more people that speak about digital hospitals and digital health than actually people are doing it. And, but just one thought here is that um, for those of us to cheer us up a little bit, for those who, who recall this, yeah, you know, the good old times, sweet memories, like a boarding pass, just like I said, with the trends in the industry, um, it will be just a question of time when you will onboard and check in into your hospital in the same manner. You know, the only thing that hospital has to do is to get rid of those fax machines. Um, so there's three trends beyond digital, which is just an enabler, which I see coming in the um, healthcare industry. And uh, namely, they are number one, there will be a shift to more outcome incentivized and outcome uh, focused um, uh, reimbursement and also 
um, uh, business models. Number two is medicine will much will be much more precise. We refer to that as a what we call 4P medicine, so it's predictive, preventive, personalized, and, and participative, sort of puts the patient in the center of all um, care activities. And number three is that, and, and I'm personally, I think that's highly needed, there will be an evolution of the organization in hospitals. Let me quickly give a little bit more meat to the bone to these three trends. So, as you may be aware, there is a, a dysfunctional kind of misincentive uh, in hospitals, saying that you get paid for the more procedures you do. Quality is not yet in the bill. And that is actually forcing doctors and, 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 and hospital providers to do something what we call the ethical, to work in what you call the ethical trap. So we are forced to provide procedures that may not be meaningful, to be honest, just to cross-subsidize and cross-fund those things that you need to do which are not being paid. So basically, that's that's the problem that many, many hospitals face today. That's why you have discussions about ICU beds and, and procedures and so forth. And I think when COVID told us one, then basically is that this can't go on forever. So my prediction for the next, I hope it will be very, very far in the future, but for the next pandemic will be that governments or payers would not care about the pricing about uh, vaccine shots, but would pay for the outcome, it would say, I have X million of people in a population. What does it cost me if you vac um, vaccinate them? I don't, and, and I will not uh, want to consider whether I need one, two or three shots and how long it will last. So basically you wanna pay for the outcome just as we already do in the automotive industry where you're buying mobility in, uh, on an industry level and also consumers do that rather than cars. Number two, the predictive and more kind of personalized medicine that's driven not just by um, AI, we've heard a lot about this, but uh, mostly also about the, uh, the gene and genomics and so forth. So every individual has their own risk. And again, taking the example of the pandemic, we learned that some vaccines work well. We also learned that in some groups they work well and others not. And then there's some risk which apply to some groups. And now fast forward, forward this in a couple of years, you would see that there are some more factors which are you will um, get to by cross um, triangling the, the data that you will get your specified dose and not the 50 milligram of taken aspirin, but you will get the 37.5 milligram of this combined with the other drug. And this perfectly will be the cure for your uh, specific disease. And lastly, the evolution of the organization. Today, hospitals are very much um, old fashioned. Basically, the organization design stems from the military. So it's very top down, very like a pyramid. You have the surgeons, you have the anesthesiologists, you have the care in nursing. Um, and actually it's not very, very functional. In industries where we now talk about agile organization, it's more around consumer journeys and consumer needs. So you would see more of those centers to say, well, actually we are a care center talking about brain, brain disease. And we need one of one psychologist, we need one neurosurgeon. We also need you know, somebody who is a dietitian or so and to kind of focus around the patient and delivering the best care, as opposed to as today, where you have kind of escalations, one, one uh, silo up just to have a discussion, discuss with the other head of department, which is just taking too uh, long for a, for a patient to uh, be in good um, treatment and good shape. So let me close here. Um, I think future is uncertain, but uh, these uh, trends, I think, are highly, let's say, um, rather an evolution than, than disruptive. So um, I hope you can join me in looking forward to these exciting trends. Thank you very much, Yanis. Now turning to our second but last speaker for today, my partner Roland Marco on the question, who owns our brain data when it comes to brain chipping? Roland is a partner at Wolfsheim Vienna with about 15 years of experience in IT and data protection law, as well as in compliance related areas. He's passionate about data-driven business models and future thinking concepts. Florian, this is your chance. Thank you, Andrea. When approaching the question, who owns your brain data when it comes to brain chipping? Um, first of all, we have to state that this is a very futuristic uh, topic and, and as Yanis uh, um, Fitzdom said, um, yeah, it, it may be interesting to see um, in the future, what we what we say uh, today about this uh, about this topic, but um, as a, as a lawyer, um, you have to approach things as they are, um, and to scrutinize first of all what is brain data and the data de derived from from chipping, and how can it be legally 
defined or classified. There are, of course, known concepts of chipping. We know animal microchipping for permanent IDs lost and found um, to search for their breeding history. Um, but we also know already now human implants, RFID chips to replace customer cards uh, or two-factor authentication, maybe just to make it easier to access the company or the copy machine. Um, but brain chipping obviously goes beyond that. It's, uh, it's about an implant, not only to record, but to potentially also control neural uh, signals. So brain data may be viewed from two different perspectives. The one is the electronic signals, yeah, and maybe also the hormone distributions, yeah, um, which are sort of tangible and measurable. And the other perspective is the thoughts, the ideas, the opinions, memories, processes which are expressed by those signals, which are intangible and, and unsorted. And as of today, brain data is not substantially, so to say, more than a cardiogram. But once, for example, by using artificial intelligence, we can bring it down to make it more tangible, to know the patterns behind. Yeah? This is uh, the point in time when, when the, the, really the, the, the legal things kicks in. Um, the goals, of course, are to communicate faster, yeah? to overcome human bandwidth issues like you know, typing here yeah, is slower than talking into uh, a, a speech recognition system or talking is slower than only thinking about what to do. Um, it's about controlling external devices, storing memories. And on the other hand, it's about maybe also to treat diseases, self-improvement like on-click attention and memory boosts, like I would like to have had at the university maybe sometimes, or from a social perspective to assess individuals' emotions, stress and resistance, and maybe even crime prevention like in the uh, movie Minority Report. There are a lot of uh, legal issues, of course, associated with this. What if the hardware or software fails? Who will decide on which AI models to follow? Who trains the AI models? Um, is there a use of private thoughts for personalized, personalized advertisements or, for example, would there be a public interest to investigate certain thoughts? Um, there are also moral and political issues, as we already heard from our previous um, uh, speakers, um, which moral or legal restrictions should apply, which moral should the system follow, must my chip adopt a foreign moral during holidays abroad? Or will chipping make us more moral or make morality irrelevant as there is no choice anymore? Um, all these um, issues will be left to more uh, to people who, who, who really, as a sociologist, but, but not so much to the lawyers maybe, but once the AI materializes, the question will boil down with respect to the property in brain data to two concepts. Yeah? Um, the one concept is brain data may be seen as a fundamental right, like for example, now it is with um, personal data in general, or will it rather be to be seen as a property um, of the one generating or facilitating such data? And again, it's like a, a, a battle uh, between concepts of the US, which is rather follow the property, um, uh, perspective and the EU, which more follow their fundamental rights. Uh, so, if you bring it down to the question um, at hand, who owns the brain data? Um, I think as of now, the question is quite clear. It is the human being owning the data, it belongs to me. However, if you come to the conclusion that you may also license such data or give consent to third parties to use it, it may boil down simply uh, to a more mundane uh, question and eventually result in the answer, it may belong to the Elon Musks out there. 
thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Roland. Well, um, that brings us to our last speaker for today, Georg Strasser, on whether there will ever be enough healthy food for the US population. I think it's a quite fitting topic given the time of the day. Um, Georg is exploring how companies can deal responsibly with food. He saw an answer to this question in Too Good To Go, which he brought to Austria in August 2019 and is today leading as Austrian country manager working with more than 1,500 partner companies to save food from going to waste. Georg, this is yours. First, I'd like to say to you, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here about a very important issue. And also thank you for the really inspiring talk so far. Um, I will cover, will there ever be enough healthy food for the Earth's population? And that's a really interesting question, and I'll come to that later, because I think we actually should um, reformulate this question. We know from the United Nations that more than 3 billion people worldwide cannot afford a healthy diet. And this problem will actually increase due to population growth. So what we have to do is to build a sustainable circular food system that ensures that we can provide healthy food for everyone of the world population today and tomorrow. And so when we discuss the problem, um, a lot of people talk about what can we do, what can we do, what can be done to do more in terms of increasing the food production. And that's really, in my opinion, the wrong approach. We rather should be talking about how can we redistribute the food we have already. Around the world right now, we currently waste one third of all the food that is produced. And that's roughly 1.6 billion tons of food that we waste every year. And that in turn would actually be enough to feed another 3 billion people. In 2050, about 9 billion people will live on our planet. And to feed everyone in 2050 without reducing the share of food we waste would actually need to increase our food production by 70%. So I repeat, we need to increase the food production by 70% if we don't stop wasting food. And that's simply impossible. Why? Because we don't have the resources on our planet. So the solution is really in the proper management in, of the, the food we're producing and not that we need to produce more. And that also comes with the price. Wasting food is not a moral problem only because we have a lot of people starving around the globe and we really have to do something here, but it also has severe consequences on the environment. We know for a fact around 8% of all the global greenhouse gas emissions come from food waste. So if it were a country, food waste would be the third largest emitter of CO2 emissions after the US and after China. So that's really a lot of environmental problems that just come from food waste. And it may surprise you, but it's quite logical. We actually need a huge amount of resources to produce food. We need water, we need land, we need fertilizers, we need labor, energy, fuel, electricity, all kinds of different resources. So the environmental impact of food production is also the main reason why it's so important that we spend our available resources in a smart and sustainable way. The good news here is when we tackle food waste, we're actually going to solve two problems at once. By using the planet's resources more responsibly and sufficiently, we can actually ensure that everyone has access to healthier food. So that's covered. And at the same time, we can fight climate change by reducing emissions. Every time we produce less, we waste less, and we're actually doing something good for the environment. And this will, in turn, and in the future, lead to a more sustainable food system in the future. We have built a really cool app. It's called Too Good To Go and offers a very simple and easy way to waste less. You download it, you save food, you do something good for the environment. But honestly, it's not enough. So we need to do way more. And it needs to be done on all different kinds of levels. We need consumers to be more aware of their impact. We need supermarkets, we need restaurants, we need all different stakeholders on a, when you look at the supply chain. And we need to take into consideration, pay way more attention to agricultural land that's a lot of times forgotten. And yeah, the problem is huge and it's pretty much everywhere. 
but the solution must be two. And to end on a positive note, I'm 100% confident and also sure that we're going to be successful in combating food waste and also tackling climate change. And the issue is becoming more and more, uh, it's becoming more and more obvious and we, we're getting more attention. And uh, the fact that I'm here invited to talk in front of a lot of lawyers, it means also that the, the topic is out there, we need to do more. And there's really no alternative also. So I want to end with stop wasting food and let's redistribute food much better. Thank you. Thank you, Georg, and uh, absolutely agree. Thanks uh, to all our speakers um, right on time. Uh, I would now open the floor um, to all the participants for their questions, comments, and feedback, and ask um, who is bold enough to step forward and raise the first question. Andrea, I would have a question to kick off a little bit, maybe, um, or actually two. Uh, my, my first question would go to Ilse, if I may. Um, very, very interesting uh, talk uh, or, or keynote that you had. I think I don't want to drift into a political discussion, but doesn't it mean that we need to think about um, a sort of general incentive for people to prepare for their own old age on the one hand, and also whether we aren't willing to commit on a society level to do something for others. Thank you, Florian, for this question. Yeah, it, is, it, uh, it would have been hard. Yes, um, that's why I said it is us that are the ones who are older in 2015, 2060. Um, yeah. Um, there, and there should be also more government spending or more attention on all this, all the, um, all the um, kind of embarrassing publicly more of prevention as a strategy. There's much we can do beforehand um, before we actually get in the need of care. But listening to Jakob and Homo Deus, I was very happy to hear that um, it will be all solved for us soon. And I had high hopes that. Um, uh, and listening to other uh, panelists today, that we might get older, healthier. Um, so put more life and healthy years into uh, the life we get. Because at, as we see right now and the numbers we have right now, it is that the ones we're talking now or people that are aged 35 to 40 today will be in need of care of some uh, someday because we all be getting older than 80 or 90 and 60% um, and 65% and of the people that are 80 and 90 today are in need of long-term care. And long-term care doesn't mean it is for a couple of weeks. Um, the duration of somebody in care today is about, that is in need of long-term care, is about seven years. Of course, that varies the intensity of that. The older we get, the more need, the more care we need. Um, but yes, as soon as we start living healthier, uh, and taking care of ourselves much better, the less years we might have that we are in need of care. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Uh, we've received a question from Ursula haber Jinke. Would you like to speak up or else I can offer to read it out loud? The question is, if the regulatory framework permitted AI in medical devices, how could it be ensured that AI is not trained uh, in a bad way by people with evil intents or based on wrong data? Maybe, maybe I can start uh, with a short uh, summary. And if some other, the other speakers have something to say to this, to this topic, they can just add uh, their thoughts. Uh, there is like real broad for regulatory framework for medical devices, which includes some quality management systems, assurances, safeguards, conformity assessment by notified bodies. And uh, as I understand it, if uh, there is a medical device with AI, uh, then as a part of this initial conformity assessment by notified body, also the uh, appropriate safeguards and managed quality management system features are assessed so that it is assured that uh, the AI is not misused. 
uh, within the medical device. If this responds the question. Yeah, if I, if, if, if I may add, there, there is a specific requirement in this um, draft EU Artificial Intelligence Act um, on data governance and data quality for training purposes in order to prevent discriminating biases. It's it's not 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 easy in in, in practice as we we've seen in the, in the past um, with uh, self learning uh, machines and chatbots. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's simply one of the of the requirements at least for high risk AI systems. There is a differentiation in the the act. Thanks. Uh, another question to um, Jakob, I believe. Um, you've mentioned a couple of very interesting uh, examples um, from out-of-the-box out of thinkers. My challenge to you would probably be, um, when talking about AI, aren't we really not only talking about advanced machine learning and um, what is missing in order to really achieve an AI um, stage is some unknown item, as I have read in a newspaper recently, flying around somewhere in whatever form, but not yet discovered by anybody on this earth? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And it might very well be, uh, as you say, uh, I mean, no one no one really knows at the moment what is required to, to achieve strong AI or artificial general intelligence. What we have at the moment is, is only narrow AI that, that can solve a very specific uh, very specific uh, tasks. Also, the, the currently uh, implemented AI, for example, in, in neural networks, they are inspired only by a very simplistic model of, of uh, how uh, neurons in, in the brain work. As the artificial uh, new neurons have essentially nothing to do uh, with, with, uh, with the biological neurons, which, which are much more capable. And there are some new theories, for example, the theory of a uh, thousand brains, it's also a book by by Jeff Hawkins. Uh, he's uh, he started the the Palm Pilot uh, company in Silicon Valley, but then he turned back to neuroscience, uh, and he, uh, he he's essentially um, investigating uh, how a real biological in intelligence works. And I think based on some of his insights that he's already sharing in, in his uh, new book, we might be able to to build uh, better systems. So the next step will be probably also connecting. I, I mean, even even this regarding this book, the next step would be uh, would be really uh, connecting um, uh, automated reasoning or symbolical uh, approaches to to uh, to to, uh, to do artificial intelligence with the machine learning based ones, which are of a completely different kind. So there are ways. And then there are ways how to start. If I can just add to that, this is Joseph. So. There is this important uh, uh, sort of topic, right? That intelligence, as we see it today, doesn't stand on its own, and it's a result of uh, of our experiences. It's basically embodiment of our. It's part of our body, right? You cannot separate the soul into some abstractions from the from the biological machine which we are, right? Through our senses, through our hormones, through are you know bio processes? It's all one one system. So the question is uh, whether the task of achieving superhuman in, superhuman intelligence is even even makes sense because it probably would require. There is one theory that it would require to basically create an artificial human. So we are more looking into into smarter uh, by nature narrow uh, artificial intelligences, which will be very good in certain domains, but they will basically possess a different type of intelligence than we as humans do, because it's unreplicable unless you build another human. That's sort of the, the theory. Many thanks. Any further comments, questions, feedback to our panelists? If not, I would like to extend a big thank you um, to our two hosts, Florian and Camila, to all the speakers and participants for sharing your know-how and contributing to the Wolf Ties, the future of Sirius. If you're hungry for more insight into what the future might look like, stay tuned and register for our next event on the future of computing. 
taking place on 10 of June. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was yeah. fun. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you.